Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We're happy you could join us. My name is Naya Hyde and I'm the marketing assistant for K-12 education products at Brooks Publishing. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You'll be muted for the webinar, but if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box. We'll take these questions after the presentation during the Q&A portion of the webinar. For the presentation, you also might want to minimize the GoToWebinar bar on your monitor so you can see more of your screen. You can do that by clicking the orange button with the arrow in the top corner of the control bar. If you need to enlarge the bar again to ask the question, you can just click the orange button again. If you experience any audio issues at any point, you can switch to phone by clicking in the audio section of the webinar panel and using the dial-in information provided. Also, we are recording this webinar. Everyone who registered for the event will receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email tomorrow. During today's presentation, Nancy Hennessy will reference content from her book, The Reading Comprehension Blueprint, Helping Students Make Meaning from Text. This book offers a clear blueprint for understanding the complexities of reading comprehension and delivering high quality evidence-based instruction that helps students construct meaning from challenging text. Aligned with the science of reading and IDA structured literacy approach, this book is a must for in-service educators and an ideal supplement to pair with core literacy textbooks. Today's teachers will get the essential knowledge and practical tools they need to help every student become a proficient reader and build a strong foundation for school success. To learn more about the book, you can visit the URL that is shown on your screen. I'm happy to announce that Brooks will be giving away three copies of, of Nancy Hennessy's book, The Reading Comprehension Blueprint. Winners will be randomly selected from today's live attendees and notified by email after the webinar. To increase your chances of winning, please be sure to submit your questions in the questions pane throughout the presentation. Also, we did want to mention at the end of the webinar, you will be prompted to complete a short survey. We would love to know what you thought of the webinar, and anyone who completes the survey will also be entered to win a copy of Nancy's book. And again, everyone watching this webinar will be able to download a certificate of attendance. For those of you watching live, you can download your certificate of attendance from the handouts pane, and live attendees will also be emailed their certificate in the next 24 hours. For those of you who are watching this webinar as a recording, stay tuned the end of today's webinar to learn how to access your certificate. Without further delay, I'm happy to introduce today's speaker. Nancy Hennessy is an experienced educator who currently works as a literacy consultant. She's the past president of the International Dyslexia Association. Nancy has worked across grade levels K-12, both general and special educators while in public schools. She provided a leadership in the development of innovative curriculum for special needs students, a statewide revision of special education code, and led a state of the art professional development program for all teachers. Nancy has delivered keynote addresses, multiple virtual and live workshops and training courses on varied topics, including skilled reading, writing, and dyslexia. She has developed in-depth professional development on the science of reading and informed instruction for the AIM Institute of Learning and Research and on dyslexia for the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Nancy authored Working with Word Meeting, Vocabulary Instruction, and Multisensory Teaching of Basic Skills, 4th Edition, and co-authored Letters Digging for Meeting, Teaching Text Comprehension, the 2nd Edition, with Louisa Motes. Most recently, she has focused on delivering virtual and in-person professional learning opportunities on reading comprehension. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Naya, for that lovely introduction. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here with us today. For some of you, you may have visited um, once before with me um, when I did the first coffee chat on comprehension, so welcome back. And for those of you who are joining today, I am so glad to have an opportunity to share with you some information about comprehension. Let me begin by saying to you, I am a teacher. I have been a teacher quite a long time. And while I no longer work directly with students, I do work with all of you educators. So I've become a teacher of teachers. I'm going to share with you experiences and learning over time today that I hope will help you enhance and elaborate on your comprehension instruction. So what will we be talking about today? Well, we'll revisit a topic that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and that is comprehension and its complexity. We'll also be thinking about the role of language comprehension and how it contributes to our students' understanding of text. 
And then we'll delve into a blueprint, which is really a metacognitive guide, a metacognitive guide that's intended to help you design and deliver effective instruction. We'll be thinking about how the blueprint connects back to these important language structures. After all, all reading is based in oral language, this translation from oral language then to written language. And then last but not least, we'll be thinking about at least one example of an evidence-based instructional framework, in this case, for sentence comprehension. So I wanted to begin with a bit of um, a, a question a truth or fib, a poll, uh, to see what um, you thought about this particular statement to help you surface and make connections to the conversation that we're going to have about comprehension. So listen as I read, and then hopefully we'll put the poll up and you'll be able to indicate whether this is a truth or a fib. The products of comprehension are indicators of what the reader understands, whereas the process, processes of comprehension our cognitive activities. So do we have the poll ready so that individuals will be able to indicate either true or false? And Naya, once we have a majority of participants who have indicated this is either a truth or a fib, will you please share with us the results? All right, so looking at the poll, it looks like 84% of the attendees said it was true and 15% said it was false. Wonderful, okay, so that's terrific. All right, so thanks so much for participating in that. And you're right on, it is true. All right, let's see if we can move on and give you a better understanding of why I asked you that question. Now, I know when we think about comprehension um, from, from an outside viewpoint, um, even from our own viewpoint in terms of working with text, it seems somewhat effortless if in fact we're a proficient reader. The reality, though, is that comprehension is one of the most complex behaviors that we are asked to engage in. In fact, Katz and Kami told us that a while back. What makes it so complex? Well, processes have a great deal to do with this, right? The reality is when we come to print, when the reader comes to print, they have to engage with that print and they have to use multiple linguistic and cognitive processes. So this description that Castle and her colleagues has provided for reading comprehension, I think is quite um, on point. And they say to us, reading comprehension is not a single entity. We can't explain it with a unified cognitive model, but rather we arrive at a product, we arrive at this ability to demonstrate what it is that we know or learn from reading as the result of using and tapping into multiple linguistic and cognitive processes. At the same time, we have to take into account the fact that as we use these processes to create a product, after all, you can't have a high quality product without high quality processes. But as we engage in, in the making of meaning, we have to keep in mind that it's also dependent upon what the reader brings to the task, right? What the text presents, so text features, the background knowledge of the reader, as well as what are the purpose and goals? What are the tasks that we ask our readers to participate in? So the second question has to do with then, well, what processes, right? And obviously, um, Castle and her colleagues and others, when we read other definitions or when we read um, about the models that are underlying reading comprehension, um, these models surface for us the importance of language. And as I said a few moments ago, oral language is basic to or foundational to developing skilled reading. Right? We have to be thinking about how we translate oral language into written. Once students become proficient in word reading, the lower strands of Paula Scarborough's reading rope, and or when we give them access, if in fact they continue to struggle, 
It is the language comprehension component that most influences our ability to be a proficient reader. So in more advanced reading, good language comprehension will be more crucial than word recognition. I'm not diminishing the role of word recognition at all, but rather focusing on the fact that if in fact we want our students to be able to extract and construct meaning from text, then they're going to have to have a solid language base. And Scarbo and others have identified for us what it is that contributes to language comprehension. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this visual metaphor that Hollis Scarborough has provided based on a meta-analysis of studies related to at-risk readers. So thinking about background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, that includes inference, and literacy knowledge. These are all components of language comprehension. Now, of course, Hollis Scarbo is not the only one who has spoken to this. Others such as uh, O'Kill and Kane and many others have also surfaced for us the role of language comprehension, the role of um, linguistic processes. And this visual that I've created that is in the book, um, in the blueprint, um, the reading comprehension blueprint, um, illustrates for us when the reader comes to text, when this reader comes to text and brings with her, in this case, um, her language capabilities, she's also faced with the demands, the linguistic demands of the text. And coupling, coupled with that is what the teacher has asked for the student to do. So the visual here represents a translation of how does the student work with these different levels of language processing with the academic demands of text, right? What is it the student needs to bring in order to create this overall understanding of text? We call this a mental model, or in this case, we also indicate it as a coherent representation of text. So what does the reader bring? Well, a knowledge of vocabulary, word meaning. And once the student is um, beginning to work with text independently, but even before as we do read alouds with young children, they're faced with the academic language of school, the academic language of text. So they have to have a breadth, depth, precision of vocabulary. They're also faced with different syntactic structures with sentences that can be very dense, have multiple ideas, that are very long, that are structured in different ways, simple compound complex, and that they have to um, think through how to connect up the meanings within and between the sentences using something called cohesive ties and connectives. They also need to bring their knowledge, their schema, and their knowledge includes, this background knowledge includes not only a knowledge of the topic that they're reading about, but it also includes text structures. And they're using this knowledge base to infer, right? Note that the arrows are going both ways, right? That they're engaging in language processing, as O'Kill and Kane would tell us, they're making meaning of the words, they're working out the syntactic structure of the sentences, they're seeing how the sentences relate to one another. They're integrating their background knowledge and they're building a representation in which the ideas hang together. They're building an overall understanding, working from the surface level, right, of the text, that's the exact words, the text base, the underlying meanings, and then creating this understanding that they take with them. So language processing plays a critical role, language comprehension, a critical role in terms of comprehension. But you also might be saying to yourself, well, in that description that you just shared, um, Nancy, I saw something about cognitive processes. And we could talk about the micro and the macro structure of text, which we do in the book, um, but we could make that a little bit more understandable, I think, with this overlay on the visual for language processing. And this is based on Judith Irwin's work. And she says to us, when the reader comes to text, they engage in cognitive processing that includes microprocesses. So they have to work with the words and sentences and extract the idea units. Integrative processes, where they have to think about how the ideas within and between sentences are related and can be integrated. 
They also have to monitor, be metacognitive, what it is that they're reading, so metacognitive processes, and elaborative processes infusing or integrating background knowledge so that they can go deeper into the text so that they can infer what the author intended for them to take away. And then last but not least, macro processes, which really relates again to that mental model or this overall understanding of the text that becomes a part of them. It's really a knowledge base that they take with them to other texts in the future. I hope you're noticing that in many instances here, um, you see arrows that are going back and forth and you see a cycle. So we have to think about comprehension as this kind of aggregation of successive units of meaning, but it's not necessarily a step-by-step -step process. And I think that's important to re recognize and realize. So you might be saying to yourself at this point, wow, that's a lot of information. That's a lot of um, uh, things to think about um, as we consider why comprehension is so complex and what the role of language processing is. So I thought you just might want to take a breath uh, and you might just feel a little bit like this. I don't know how much longer I can last. I may have to drop out. And he's saying to her, but honey, you're the teacher and we are the teachers. So there's much for us to learn, there's much for us to do. Um, and very often I will say, as we work at this, we have to be thinking about this from the perspective of, um, although I don't love this analogy, how do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. So taking a little bit in each time and elaborating really on what our mental model of comprehension is. But perhaps even more importantly than that, um, being able to translate this information then into practice. And so that's where I'm going next. I want to share with you really a framework or that metacognitive guide that can help us think through um, what the research has told us, what the evidence has told us, um, how we can use these theoretical models then to shape our instruction. So that guide, uh, the vehicle for shaping our instruction for using this information is the blueprint. So what is the blueprint? So just in general, a description of the blueprint and then we're going to actually look at it, all right? and um, take it apart a bit um, uh, so that we understand how it directly connects to practice. But beginning, first of all, with the fact that it's an evidence-based master plan. So the blueprint for reading comprehension that I'll be sharing in a moment is based on Hollis Scarborough's work. It's based on the language comprehension strands of the rope. It's based on the work of Oak Hill and Kane, and then Oak Hill, Kane and Elbro, as well as others, right? It is intended to help you organize and scaffold your instruction, your preparation of text. So regardless of whether or not the texts are provided through your curriculum or you're choosing texts or you're um, uh, selecting some additional or supplemental texts, all right, it's intended to help you prepare the text and to take into account what it is that goes into comprehension, that in fact it is complex. Right. It calls for the use of evidence-based strategies and activities. So I will share with you some activities for sentence comprehension today, but please think about what you bring to the task. Think about what you use in your settings, in your practice, in your classrooms that connects to what I'm sharing with you. All right. And it also allows for flexibility because remember I said that um, how, how a student approaches the, the text um, is going to be very dependent upon the nature of the text itself. And as our students move through the grades and begin to read uh, using their word recognition skills or we provide them with access, their text will contain academic language. And so they're going to have to be facile in terms of academic language, more complex vocabulary, more advanced syntactical structures and so on. Also the student, what, do, what is the student bringing? And so certainly our students sometimes may be struggling with, with comprehension, um, may have difficulty with particular aspects of comprehension, um, or may be good comprehenders, but that doesn't mean that we don't attend to all of these different aspects of comprehension because comprehension, those components that I mentioned, the language comprehension components, 
Those are growth constructs. Once we learn how to read words, we know how to read words, right? But we continue to grow in our vocabulary, our knowledge of how sentences are formed, in our background knowledge, and so on. Right? So it allows for flexibility. It also acknowledges, and I think this is really important, it acknowledges the metacognitive nature of teaching, right? I don't know any educators that don't consistently ask themselves as they get ready to um, teach, um, what is it that they want to teach? How will they go about doing it? How will they know if their students are successful? Metacognitive. And then as they're teaching and as they're working with the students, continually asking themselves, what else do I need to question? What else do I need to do? Um, did this work or not? So just the, the use of questioning throughout, I think is just something that all of us do as effective educators. So the blueprint, it has many, many questions embedded. So now you're probably saying, well, what does this blueprint look like? So here's the blueprint. And the blueprint is introduced early on after building some background knowledge about comprehension in the book itself, right? And again, it's a framework. So I want to really stress um, the fact that this is not a lesson plan. This is not even a unit organizer, right? This is a framework, right? And so as a result, it's, it's a holistic way of thinking about, wow, comprehension is complex. How do I think about this from a broader point of view from a more complicated point of view um, and then how can I break it down as I think about working with different texts and with my students one bite at a time so very quickly all right as you take a look at the blueprint what you see on the left hand side are the components of the blueprint and under preparing for instruction there are two components a discussion about critical understandings of text. Note the questions that are, are there for you to pose to yourself. And secondly, purpose for reading text. Note the questions that are there for you to pose to yourself. And I'm going to talk about those a little bit more in detail. Now, in terms of the actual reading of text, what are the components that we want for all of us to be thinking about? Well, certainly vocabulary, right? So breadth, depth, precision, right? And so there are questions that we find here in the blueprint, by the way, based totally on what the literature tells us is an effective approach to teaching this particular language process or skill. Then language structures, right? AKA syntax sentence comprehension, right? And note that it focuses in on how we build meaning, phrases, clauses, sentence comprehension. And then knowledge, which I noted earlier, is not only background knowledge, but also text structure. And then levels of understanding, that includes inference. So working at the surface level, the text base, and then the mental model. And last but not least, an expression of understanding. So the blueprint accommodates not only for process, but also product. And again, you see the arrow, which it runs throughout. It's saying to you, instruction in these different areas, activities in these different areas, strategies in these different areas can occur before, during, or after reading, right? That's flexibility. And that you want your students consistently monitoring their comprehension throughout. And so you'll prompt that in different ways, right? So now let's take a look at these components of the blueprint um, the preparing for instruction, and then we'll look at text reading, language structures in a little bit more detail. Oh, but maybe we should check your understanding before that. So having introduced the blueprint to you, I want you to be thinking just a little bit about, this is not a poll, so you can just self-reflect and answer to yourself, which of the following is not correct about what the blueprint actually is? Not correct. The blueprint is a lesson plan, is based in evidence, is metacognitive in nature, scaffolds and organizes instruction. And I'm hoping you said to yourself, it's not a lesson plan. It's a framework. It's a master plan. All right. So let's then just take a look at this, just the be beginning pieces here that have to do with preparing for instruction. 
and note the questions that you see to the side, and I'm going to talk about each of these very briefly. So I want you to be thinking, regardless of whether or not you have a curriculum um, in which the, the readings um, are included, or if you're choosing read alouds, or you're choosing supplemental readings um, to support your curriculum, I have always want you thinking about what do you want your students to learn from text? What are the big ideas? What are the critical understandings that you want your students to take away? So big ideas um, are the ideas we want our students to get inside of, all right? These are not necessarily the details. We want them to go beyond discrete facts or skills and focus on larger concepts, principles, or processes. So for instance, within the book, um, we provide some ideas about critical understandings, what would be a topic, what would be the understandings. And one for fifth grade, for instance, a topic might be coming of age, right? And the critical understanding then might have something to do with um, uh, coming of age as a person's transition from childhood to adulthood, or both our environment and the people within our lives and communities can impact us. And we would be thinking about this um, as a way of uh, developing this knowledge base over time. So some of you may do um, use themes, for instance, um, take a thematic approach. This would be very similar to what we're talking about here. Also making the point that reading lessons need to have double outcomes. I think we get very focused on developing skill. And yes, we do want to develop these processes and skills to focus on developing these language and cognitive capabilities. But at the same time, really comprehension is knowledge. So we want our students to walk away with knowledge. We want them learning not only skills, but content. Okay. And in terms of choosing texts, again, if reflecting on the text that you're currently using or those texts that you might be selecting, thinking about how they um, support the development of these understandings. And so thinking about these questions, here come some questions again. Will the readings that I currently use or I'm, I'm choosing develop these identified enduring understandings, big ideas for my students? Will they provide opportunities to develop necessary language processes and skills? Remember the focus here is on developing that language that is necessary. Do they provide opportunities to develop academic language? Because as students move through the grade, this is the language of school. Do they represent different genre and disciplines? So we have an integrated approach. And for our struggling readers, do we provide access? And then purpose connects to this, of course. So in this case, purpose includes not only a literacy instructional goal and activity, but a content instructional goal and objectives. So we want them to acquire knowledge of critical topics, building background knowledge, building a knowledge base, right? And we want them acquiring critical language skills. And our purpose is central to both, but it will differ from lesson to lesson dependent on the blueprint focus, flexibility, and student needs. And it's accomplished over time. Remember I said comprehension is a growth construct, so oftentimes we come back to we come back to these critical ideas or topics across grade levels. All right, so the first part then of the blueprint, preparing for instruction, critical understandings of text, purpose for reading. What should you th be thinking about? What should you walk away with here? One, that you want your students to not only acquire these language, necessary language processes and skills, but you also want them to learn content, to walk away with understandings, and that the text that you use make a difference here. So I am very much about using age and grade appropriate text with our students for comprehension. All right, so now we can shift our thinking and note the arrow again in blue. We're going to focus on the actual reading of the text and some of what we need to be thinking about and considering as we develop instruction. Again, keep in mind, we don't accomplish this necessarily in one day or even a few days. We, we build on these um, processes and skills over time. And we're always cognizant of what does the text ask of our students and what are our students bringing to the text? So I'm choosing to address, um, and let me go back for a moment just so we're certain 
note the smaller arrow, I'm choosing to address language structures, phrases, clauses, sentence comprehension. You see that on the reading rope, it translates into sentence comprehension, right? Now, why have I chosen that? Well, I've chosen that because there is a close relationship between syntax, understanding of grammar, they're not exactly the same, but similar, right? There's a close relationship between that and reading comprehension. So I think oftentimes we think about comprehension from the point of view of word meaning, but we have to be thinking about those words live within sentences. Sentences are the worker bees of the text. And so how do we build meaning in a sentence? Well, we build meaning through word, through phrase, through clause, and through different sentence structures. And oftentimes when we bring our students to age and grade appropriate text, to text that is written in academic language, there will be um, some challenges for them in terms of understanding the sentence itself. So the question that you find, all right, on the blueprint, and you find these questions for each of these components that have to do with language, right, are questions that are based in what we have learned from the literature about effective instruction, informed instruction. How and when will you directly teach sentence comprehension? How and when will you teach students to work with challenging sentences? How will you facilitate the integration of ideas within and between sentences, something called cohesive ties and connectives, which I don't have enough time to talk about at the moment? How and when will you teach your students to work with these? Why are you doing this? If a reader cannot derive meaning from individual sentences that make up a text, that is going to be a major obstacle in text level comprehension. All right. So you might be saying to yourself, what exactly does she mean? about sentences and sentences being difficult. And I've always um, thought about sentences from the writing perspective, right? But not so much from a reading perspective. Well, they're closely related, right? And that's important for us to keep in mind that there's this kind of wonderful reciprocal relationship between writing and comprehension, and we certainly see it here. So what might be difficult? Well, Cheryl Scott, and others have identified very clearly for us what might be difficult. Sentences may be very long. They may be very dense. Remember, I had this noted on that visual on levels of language processing. Density means there's more than one idea unit within a sentence. And idea units are usually signaled by the verbs. There are embeddings, things like relative clauses, right? There are dependencies things like subordinate clauses, and sometimes order, active, versive, passive. So I wanted to just show you a couple of sentences from different texts at different grade levels. The first one being Dear Benjamin Banneker, which of course is a narrative, right? And I want you to note this would probably be a text that you might use with third graders, for instance, right? I want you to note, first of all, the length of the sentence, I want you to note that it's introduced by what? A dependent clause or a subordinate clause, right? And I also want you to note that he discovered to make a decent living. He had little choice but, right? So even the structure of the sentence is interesting in that it begins with a dependency and then you have what? This relationship between really um, two other clauses. Right. The second one, the founding fathers are a group of men who were key fig figures in initiating America's independence from Britain and establishing American government and early international relations. That's a mouthful. That's sixth or seventh grade, all right? Um, I think it comes from common lit, the founding of American democracy. And I want you to note the embedding here. Who were key, key figures? Who were those key figures, by the way? Oh, I guess the founding fathers. Um, and then the last sentence, Stalin, a brutal legacy. And here, this is um, more of an eighth or ninth grade, also common lit. Um, Stalin's genocidal record was the product of, and it goes on. Look at the length of that sentence. So, you know, one of the things you want your students to be able to do is to be able to find the who and the do. We start talking with them very early on about that. But as, as they move through the grades, that becomes more difficult. So we have to be directly teaching them how to work with sentences. 
So here's the question that I'm sure you all had in mind as I began to talk about this, is what does an informed framework for sentence comprehension and instruction include? And I want you to note that it includes both intentional and incidental on-purpose instruction. So within the blueprint, as we look at each one of these different components, we talk about why, the connection, we talk about student examples, and then we talk about what to do. And I don't have enough time to delve into each of these, but I wanted to say to you that it is important that indirectly through the development of oral language, through shared reading, through teacher talk, through writing, we develop this awareness and then facility with sentences. But we also can do that intentionally, direct instruction, the modeling of, and then the practice within reading comprehension. And we can pull directly from the text that we're working with examples, and then we can use those examples, sentence examples, to work on things like grammar-based deconstruction, sentence-based activities, and cohesive device. And I have an example of grammar-based deconstruction working with parts of speech. So let me share that quickly with you. So here's an example, words working together. There's actually two examples here. On the left-hand side, you have an example in which we use questioning that focuses on the function of parts of speech. Syntax is a vehicle for conveying meaning. We have to teach our students not only definitions of parts of speech, but the role that they play within a sentence. So there you see a sentence again from the founding of American democracy, and here are the questions I might ask. Which word or words answer who or whom? So I'm really looking for nouns, aren't I? Mm-hmm, because those are the questions that nouns answer. Which words tell what the soldiers did? I'm really looking for action words or verbs. Which words tell which soldiers? Oh, I'm looking for adjectives. So one of the things we have to keep in mind is through questioning and through teaching our students how words actually work within sentences, we can develop this awareness of parts of speech and how sentences are constructed. The second activity takes words also from the founding of American democracy, creates a set of word cards and a structured organizer. And again, we need to be teaching our student, there are certain types of words that answer these questions, who or what, is or was doing, which one, what kind, how many, when, where, how, right? So we have nouns, we have verbs, we have adjectives, we have adverbs, and we can have them working either individually or with a partner doing a sort. Of course, we would model ahead of time. So beginning with how words function, the parts of speech, then the phrases, the clauses, and different types of sentences, and directly working with words and sentences from the text that we're reading, we could do it before, Right? We might do some work informally during, or we could do it after. So I want to leave you with this thought. <laughs> All right. Um, the blueprint is intentionally designed to support you right? as you use your knowledge to identify what your learning goals are, to set your purpose, to organize your instruction, to select activities, and then monitor students' progress. Right? If you want to build the comprehension house, which you see here to the right, one of the things that you need are tools. You need a blueprint, all right, and then you need the tools. And the tools have everything to do with strategies and activities, all right, that help you develop things like vocabulary, background knowledge. They're central. They're the supporting pillars, right? Um, along with text structures, levels of understanding, sentence comprehension, and then you can put the roof right on your house. So consider your current practices and be thinking about what if I shared that might be helpful for you to begin to think about? Maybe just one thing, all right, because there's a great deal to comprehension. So here's what we talked about today, all right? Hopefully you're walking away with just a little bit more information about comprehension. You've shifted your mental model, your overall understanding just a bit, and you have some ideas as to how to support your students. All right, so um, I think Naya will join us again and perhaps um, monitor the chat box to see if there are any questions. Um, yeah, we'll see. yeah. We had a lot of great uh, questions um, from our attendees. They had an amazing presentation. Um, so the first question is why is it so important to 
understand the difference between comprehensive products and processes. Okay. So I intentionally did the truth or fib about processes versus products because I think we have an overemphasis on product within our classroom and within our schools. And I don't say that to diminish the importance of students being able to express their understanding, but the reality is you don't get a product without making certain that those processes are in place. And so that gives us a different perspective in terms of the strategies and the activities that we use to help develop those processes. It also allows for us to dig a little deeper in terms of why are our students having difficulty? Where might the breakdown be? Yeah. Awesome, great response. Um, another question, can you provide some examples of other critical understandings and texts that would support development of big ideas? Yeah, so um, can, can you say it again, Naya? It was a little... Yeah, sorry about that. Um, can you provide some examples of other critical understandings and texts that would support development of big ideas? Yeah, so one of the things that I tried to provide within the book, and actually a colleague of mine, Julia Salomon, helped to develop this, was examples at different grade levels. And so I've already shared one with you for grade five, uh, coming of age, in which you know the enduring understanding, for instance, might be coming of age as a person's um, transition from childhood to, to adulthood, and then there would be essential questions, content goals, literacy goals, and then resources that would go along with that. Another might be um, the development of democracy. And so thinking about that founding of democracy, um, article and maybe that would be something in third or fourth grade when we begin to talk with our students um, about the fact that we have a declaration of independence, we had a revolution, why do we have a revolution? So understanding why people might want independence, so kind of around that critical understanding or how do they go about achieving independence and then identifying readings that would connect. Um, Another um, uh, topic that would uh, um, evolve into uh, a critical understanding might have to do with perseverance, and um, that's a favorite of mine. And um, what, what's the meaning of that, and how does perseverance contribute to one's quality of life or the quality of society and so on? So um, one can come up with these at, at each grade level. Very often um, when uh, schools are using themed curricula, um, uh, this this emerges. Sometimes teachers will work interdisciplinary um, and, and look at um, what can they carry across the varied uh, disciplines during the day in terms of these big ideas. Yeah. Okay. Do we still have Naya? Oh my goodness. Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, oh, what, is that's role, that's what is the role of cohesive devices in sentence comprehension? That's another question we got. Okay. Okay. So, so, that's, so that's, 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 that's a wonderful question. I'm echoing a little bit and I apologize for that. Um, so when we begin to think about sentences and how, you know, one by one the sentences add up to the gist, Sentences relate to one another uh, in different ways. We can integrate meaning within and between sentences, um, make sense of them really, have them cohere, hang together, through the use of something called cohesive devices. There are two types of cohesive devices. One are cohesive ties. For instance, all right, when we use pronoun pronouns um, following, let's just say, Benjamin Banneker was an activist. Maybe that's the first sentence he was responsible for. Who's he? Oh, it's Benjamin Banneker. So we might use a pronoun to reference or to connect up those two sentences. Um, we might say something like um, Stalin um, was a brutal dictator, the leader of um, a revolution. Uh, here we use a synonym or a substitution and we might say, who's the leader of the revolution? Oh, that was Stalin, right? So those are a few examples of um, cohesive ties. Uh, connectives are what you typically think of as conjunctions for the most part, sometimes prepositions. And so um, they carry meaning as well. When we use that little conjunction and, it's additive, but, mm, reverse direction and so on. And that connects up ideas 
and signals relationships between ideas as well. This is really important because oftentimes our students kind of get lost in the text when we begin to use pronouns, substitutions, or even um, they don't recognize, they don't transfer this understanding of conjunctions when we teach them in terms of complex sentences, they don't transfer that over to their reading. Yeah. Okay. That was another great response. Um, we'll ask one last question just to be conscious of everyone's time. Yes. Uh, knowing how important informed sentence comprehension instruction is, what supports can you recommend that are available for educators in order to become more comfortable with teaching the content? So uh, I think if you're asking about activities, um, if that's what you mean by supports, um, you'll find a, a number of different activities um, within the book itself. Um, other individuals such as Margie Gillis and Nancy Eberhardt um, speak to the importance of syntax and sentence comprehension. And so if you Google them and take a look at um, uh, some of their resources, and um, if you directly email me, um, nhennessy at charter.net, I can send you some other references and ideas for sentence comprehension. It's something I've been interested in for quite a long time and have, have done a number of workshops on. Awesome. Well, thank you, Nancy, for answering all those great questions. We have so many questions we didn't get to, but um, just again, thank you everyone for sharing your questions. We really appreciate that. And again, we appreciate your responses, Nancy. Okay, well, thanks so much. I'm appreciative to Brooks for the opportunity, but um, I'm particularly thankful for those who joined and will be joining. And um, now you may want to send some of those questions my way. All right. Okay. At some point. Would you, all right. Would you mind advancing to the next slide? Uh, I don't mind at all. Here we go. <laughs> Um, everyone watching this webinar, just want to remind you, you will be able to download your certificate of attendance. Um, live attendees will be emailed their certificate in the next 24 hours. I also just want to remind everyone that you will be prompted to complete a short survey at the conclusion of the presentation. We would love to know what you thought of the webinar. And again, anyone who completes the survey will be entered to win a free copy of Nancy's book. Another reminder that we are offering 20% off on our products, including Nancy Hennessy's The Reading Comprehension Blueprint through the end of January. And anyone who watches this webinar or the recording can use the code COFFEECHAT shown on your screen at checkout to receive the discount. If you're looking for more professional development webinar opportunities over the coming weeks, be sure to visit the Brooks Publishing website for the latest additions to our Coffee Chat series. We're hosting chats every Wednesday with our esteemed authors, and we would love for you to join us. And for additional supports, you can visit bit.ly slash COVID dash education. Um, on this page, you'll find a collection of recommended reading, downloadable resources, and professional development webinars from books and leading organizations. Just one last reminder for everyone watching live, you may download your certificate um, and it will also be emailed in, uh, in the next 24 hours. For those of you who are watching this webinar as a recording, please follow the link on your screen to access your certificate of attendance. And again, Nancy, you did amazing. Um, we appreciate you doing a second chat with us. And again, everyone, we really appreciate your questions um, and we hope you have an amazing day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great one.